quality employment. Yours might say accommodation, cafe, about us, directions. But essentially, we're going to work that out. And you never, you never just do it the first time and then it's right. You know, it's an iterative process. You can do it and say, well, do we really need that page? Should I maybe move that to the top level navigation? So everything along there in pink is what would, the, what would be the top level navigation. Right? Um, then you would think about the style of navigation. User experience studies suggest that you should have more, no more on the desktop. And I'm going to talk about mobile as well. No more on the desktop of seven options. The more choice you give people, the more difficult it is for them to choose to make a, a selection. I would say try and, try and get it to five if you can. Be really, really focused. If you've got a website just now, and I would show you Google Analytics as well, Google Analytics will tell you what your most visited pages are on your website, so you'll know the most popular pages that people go to on your website. And if it's not already a main navigation button, it probably should be. We tend to remember the first word we see and the last word we see. So placement of the navigation is really important as well. What's the first button and what's the last button along to the right? And naming, we've talk, I've talked about that quite a few times. So what, what words do your customers use? So you can have different styles of navigation. Object would be like, objects kind of like John Lewis's and like garden and home and kids. And then you've got action-based navigation, eat, stay, do. Audience-based is like families, corporate schools. So let me show you. Right, so this is the old uh, website for visits and Andrews that I worked on, where we had action based that said plan, do, stay, shop, eat, and about. And then at Harvard University, they've got different tiers of navigation, and this is where choosing the right theme or template or working with the designer is important, because they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. They have fifteen navigation buttons and a call to action that says read story, but not all of the navigation buttons are indeed the same color or the same size. So the main navigation is actually about Harvard, admissions and aid, schools and campus, that's only four. But if you know who you are when you come to the website, you can click on staff, students, alumni, parents, visitors, media. Right, so they're catering, they're, they're offering different styles of navigation, but that's good design because it's balanced. It's in different sizes, There's, it's, it's prioritised. And if you think about <coughs> newspapers or magazines, if any of you still buy them, that's how the front page of a newspaper or a magazine is designed. Sometimes there's a lot of messages on it, but there's usually one key message, which is in the biggest font size, and it might be in a different colour. That's the headline. Right. So a lot of things that you know about the offline world apply to the online world. It's just kind of common sense. Then we have challenges with mobile, right? So most, most if you go to Wix now, or to GoDaddy, or pick a WordPress theme, and I'll show you some of those, they are what we call mobile responsive, in that they shrink, and you get what's called a hamburger menu. <clears throat> so this is, this is supposed to look like a hamburger. And the problem was, stroke is, a lot of people didn't know what it was, so people testing out their websites would add the words menu or put it in a box so people knew that if you clicked on it that the navigation menu appeared. And my friend who used to work at the BBC um, told me, it was about three or four years ago, he said, you know, that hamburger menu is just really not working and like on the sports page on the phone, so we're getting rid of it. I was like, oh, and he's like, yeah. So next year, we're getting rid of it. I said, really, next year? Because by the time next year comes, I'm pretty sure everybody will know what that is. <laughs> then you'll have removed it because people eventually learn how to use it. So you need to consider as well um, what the mobile version is going to look like. There's a different option there with the menu. It just actually says menu. There's no hamburger. Um, there's in home base, and, I, and a bit like Hilton, the way Andrew said earlier, home base, this will be built bespoke. Right? So home base have got stores, basket, and the menu in the search box. <coughs> what happens at the BBC is that they design for four screens. Like they designed for tablet, mobile, television, and desktop. What that means is that the designer creates four design templates. And whenever you call up that page from whichever, whether it's from a mobile or a tablet, the server detects the device usage and serves the right design to you. So that's, that's bespoke work. Right? So that's the level that they go to to supply good user experience. 
Um, here, here in Oxfam, you've only got four. When you click on the menu, there are only four <coughs> options. What we do, get involved, shop online and donate. Why is donate orange? That's what they want you to do, it's a priority. That's user experience. So sometimes, um, if you go to an agency, they might talk about designing for mobile first, that they'll focus it. So rather than this website collapse, that the website starts this size and then expands. And, and that you tend not to get that with Wix, with uh, GoDaddy or Weebly, with predefined templates. It starts big and then it collapses. But I suspect that will evolve. <coughs> Then the other thing, so we create the site map, and then the other thing that we might do is work out the customer journey. Does anyone get loose? Can I ask a question about the site map? Because um, we used to always have a see a home button, but that's now disappearing. You just click on the logo. Uh, yeah, there's debates about that. This is what I was looking for. There's debates about that in terms of usability as to whether you should actually have the whole button or, or the logo. Right. But it's in. Um, we talk in advertising and marketing about the space that you've got to put up a billboard or a web page. That's your real estate. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's just taking up useful real estate and it's easier just to make it the home button because mm -hmm. you're trying to make your navigation more focused. Right. Um, Kay, can we look at your website? Mm -hmm. right. Is that okay? You okay? I don't mind because I just literally threw it together over lamin, so it's I'm quite happy to. Is that okay. your disclaimer? Yeah. No, it's, it, was, it was definitely better than the last one. Mm -hmm. um, there's still a huge improvement, hence we are looking at, this isn't rebranded or anything. No, that's okay. What's the web address? Uh, Shemore on Loch Lomond. So how's that? Is that S -H, S H E M O R E mm -hmm. on Loch Lomond. Oh, Shemore. Yeah. On Loch Lomond. Co.uk? Dot com, I think. Da, 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 da. On one. No, it's the, it's the Wi Fi, definitely. Yes, the Wi If the BBC doesn't load quickly, then it's definitely the Wi Fi. Okay, right. Wait until that. So, do, doing your site, your site map for your website might be something like this, right? So, you might actually. Let me see. Oh, is it back? Oh, it's still, it's still coming, it's still coming. Right, so I might then have and say, right, that's the home page. And then, what, what, have you, what have you got? What have you, have, you, what have you got a button that says accommodation? I think so. <laughs> right. So, there's the yeah, home the page. Buttons are up. They're up. Our story. Oh, yeah. Right, brilliant, okay. So then, uh, so we've got our story. And we've got, um, so we've got tours, the cottage, location, gallery, booking and availability, more. Right. So, so you would basically take each of those tabs, might be a post-it note or a piece of paper, right? So we've got um, farm tours. And I know there's not a book now button in the top right-hand corner, but there will be this evening. Let's see. Cottages. Right. I'm going to put it up. So you might do something like this. Not tonight if you're coming to Tiger Lily. But maybe tomorrow if you've been to Tiger Lily. But at some point, Alan will. And ideally, before you, before you, I, I, I mean, obviously, if you want to go with Wix, go with Wix, go with, go with GoDaddy. We'll talk about them in a minute. But you would start doing all of this first <clears throat> before you pick a team. And then I would suggest, and this makes your website tangible because, because I have lived before the web. And, and design brochures with people and observe people trying to, my customers trying to get their head around this. I did notice a big differential that when I was doing brochures with people, even um, gentlemen who I thought were not really into the aesthetics of the business would sit and go, is that high gloss? And then he would say to, because it, there was a hotel I worked in, it was predominantly men, it was it sometimes it looked a bit like the Crossroads Motel. <laughs> Again, not, there's a few touches that we changed, shall we say, and the two of them would sit and go, oh, yeah, I don't like that. And they would have an opinion about it, and then I would bring them other brochures and they go, too flimsy, too flimsy. And as soon as we moved from that to the website, hands off, don't want to know anything about it. Can't touch it, can't feel it. So I think going through this process makes your website quite touchy feely. <coughs> so let's just see, what have we got, um, is there a contact? Let's pretend there's a contact. Thing that says contact us, right? So there will be one somewhere. I think that's a Wix thing they do that, and I can't actually, it's a really bad system. Like, okay. to, it goes by email. So, so let's say somewhere down here, there, there's various other pages, and there's a contact us page. 
think it's further <laughs> down because I think at that time everyone was doing it because we had to have the, uh, our story at that time that the lambing was really important to have in so we did that. And That's okay. Like don't want folk to contact you, do you? No, which is stupid. It should have been up Sorry. there. <laughs> so I have actually fine. had that conversation with clients and they've said definitely not. <laughs> 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 right, um, so you could then say I'm going to walk through my own department store. So I want to go, to, I want to look at the cottages. So if I click here, where does that take me to? Right, so there might be another page there. Or if I have another page here that says gallery and I click on that, that might also bring me here. But what I want to do after that, then I probably want to buy if I like it, so then I have to get to here. So what I would advise that you do when you create your site map is that you either get a post note or sheets of paper that are your web pages and you walk through your own department store and say, well, is that good enough? If I land here, where would I like to go next? And have I designed this properly? And that's what we're actually expecting, either the freelancer, <clears throat> and, and they might just, if they've been doing it a long time, you've mentioned a couple of what you're working with, they will instinctively know how to do this. But it gives you a bit more control over it. This is essentially your product. It's like another, if you have an office, or two different locations. This is another location, it's just virtual. You still own it the same way that you would if you owned a bricks and mortar cafe. So you should know how to get around it and you should know how you expect people to get around it. So essentially, on my slides, that's what we call a customer journey. We've designed a customer journey, but it can be as basic as just doing this. And if we go back here, I'm not gonna log into Google Analytics just now, but I will log in. Um, let me see, no, that's what I want to show you. Uh, on Google Analytics, you can see a visual like this, which is how people journey through your web pages. Google Analytics is completely free. And in orange, it is showing you where people are, are leaving, where there's drop off. Now that's fine, people will leave, that's absolutely okay. But in some reports, you'll see that the drop off is significantly higher than others, right? Not necessarily, uh, not necessarily here. Yeah, so, We've worked out, let's go back. We've worked out roughly all the pages that we want. We know the kind of style of navigation that we want. This is all part of our continued plan. We've considered mobile, and you know what? We might not have any option if our budget stretches to a Wix template, that's absolutely fine, and it collapses and gives us the hamburger menu, then so be it. And we've thought about the customer journeys then you could actually draw it out. And I don't think you're not necessarily going to be marked for this, you don't have to hand it in at the end per se. But again, in the agency, this is what they would do. They would work out the layout of the page before they apply any colour schemes or design and discuss it with you and say, do you think that that makes sense? So we'll have a video there, what would the video be? And they should talk to you about things that Andrew said, so the video will be hosted on YouTube, so it's not living on your page. What would the main image be here? What would, you know, it's obviously got, they've got different buttons up here for language, but you might have your basket there. So you could actually lay the page out. And you, you can do that. You just need to get a big packet of paper from Morrison's and a pen. And you can actually consider what would this physically look like? Because if you were launching, I think, a new cafe or decorating the inside of a new cottage, you would have an opinion about that and you would be able to go and touch and feel it because it's yours. And I think that you should do the same thing with your website. Because what becomes very expensive is if you haven't thought this out <coughs> before, I would say before you go to approach the person you're going to, who's going to build it for you, and then you say, oh, I forgot the gallery, or I forgot this, whatever. You know, any additional changes are going to cost you money. So more, the more you can think about this in advance. It's almost like they've started to knit the jumper. <laughs> but you've decided you want an extra pocket or an extra button somewhere, and you think, oh, I'm like, okay, how do, I, how do I now fit that in? So I'm just thinking about how many clicks does it take to get to the required action, and that, that can be an inquiry form. Right? It can be to find the telephone number. It doesn't necessarily have to be for a monetary sale. And then I mentioned this morning, about, you know, big players like Amazon and Marks and Spencer and Sainsbury's, they spend a fortune on this because a small percentage of increase and conversion can make a lot of money for them. So my advice would be to go and look at other e-commerce websites and see how they're laid out. Think, and, and you know, as I think Andrew mentioned it earlier as well, you know, but um, 
websites that you like to use and why you use them and what type, type of functionality they've got. You don't have to have their budget. You have to have a plan and you have to understand what you need because it will allow you to pick a better theme or template and I, I am going to show you some of them. Um, so we talked about this as well, thinking about your copy <coughs> and managing attention spans. If people read slower, so what copy do you need to put in the page and how can you best provide that copy? So this is from, if anyone knows these sort of snack boxes you get from Grey's. So rather than providing lots of copy, they've provided an illustration which explains how it works. They've hundreds of snacks. You uh, tell us where you want it delivered, we put it through your letterbox and you eat it. I thought I'd actually taken this nice thick slide out, but I just showed to you. Um, desirable images, we've talked about that a wee bit as well. That's not what the pandas look like in the Edinburgh Zoo website. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I'd taken that one out. Because usually there's a slide of what the panda does look like in the Edinburgh Zoo website, which is a bit kind of like... <laughs> right, am I still in the zoo? Yeah, you're still in the zoo. Uh, which, is, which, every time I see it, always makes me think, I probably shouldn't take kids to the zoo. You know, I look at it and I think, well, I don't think they should be in a zoo because it looks pretty miserable. Um, so I would, I've, I've talked to you about photography and Andrew's mentioned that, so we'll not labour that point. Because we, the, the web has evolved, but we've learned how to use the web. We've learned our way around the <coughs> supermarket. There are a lot of very recognisable icons in our, our life now that we expect to see, um, like the email icon and like the actual, the actual telephone that looks like this. That doesn't look exactly like that, but you, you can. So you know when you see that icon, you can click on it. I'm working with a product design company just now. <coughs> They're very, it's a bit like working with architects as well. It's very high end, everything's got to be perfect. All the pencils are sharpened to the same height and all the rest of it. And there's a whole thing about a lobster design, a lobster telephone that some, I, I don't really, it's, an, it's a product design joke that I don't get. So they've decided they'd like to have this lobster instead of a telephone icon. Like, but why? because the majority of the people in the world will not recognise that, and then they'll get frustrated. <laughs> so there's lots of things that you can do that you will recognise on templates, like here, you know, like at the Apex Hotel, where there's a button where you can email them. Um, the, the key for Book Night, because it's the key to your room. Um, the search icon there in Bowden. These are things that we see again and they again. They have a satchel. Hmm? Uh, yeah, I would argue, yeah. Well, this satchel was tied in the middle, you know, like a velvet oh, satchel, oh, and it was yeah. a step too far. <laughs> <laughs> and it was also like six years ago. Like, Come on, guys, right? So, um, I've actually taken out a slide that says lunch, because we're running down. <laughs> so this was like, are there any questions before lunch? Are there any questions? No. No, Caroline said no, there's no questions. <laughs> Come on, I might joke. Okay. <laughs> so, um, we've got our plan, we, we know how to plan, we can even draw our own website, we can send customer journeys, we're aware of what we need to do with wording and imagery, so how will we now go about, buy, about buying a website? So there's a whole variety of options. <clears throat> you can lease a pre-built solution, so we'll look at some of them, we'll look at Squarespace, for example, whereby Squarespace and others like Weebly, GoDaddy, Wix, One on One, Moonfruit, the list goes on have a catalogue of pre-built websites that are usually um, saved by sector. So we'll probably, we'll just go onto the Squarespace website and I'll show you. And the design, is, the design you see and the functionality you see is exactly what you get for a fixed fee every single month. So Squarespace are kind of the new kid on the block for the last couple of years. Um, I would say the templates are a bit better than the, the older guys like Wix and Weebly. The search engine optimization functionality is better. The content management system where you upload images and input the words is better. So they start at £10 every single month. But they also host your website for you so you don't have an additional fee. It's a hosted solution. Um, you could learn a platform. So you could go and learn WordPress. WordPress is an open source. They call it open source. It's a community of developers who have built websites, pre-built websites, a bit like Squarespace, but you have to host it yourself. And there's a massive range. It's, um, it's like Amazon for websites. There's so much choice. And at, this, you know, at lunchtime, Andrew was talking about um, online booking solutions. In the WordPress community, and in some of the other lease communities, they have add-ons that they either call an app or a plugin. So in the WordPress community, there are booking plugins there are um, calendar plugins, there are contact form plugins, there's lots of extra functionality. 
And they're, it's all built by a worldwide community of developers who build nice pieces of functionality and then throw it in the pot. Right? The great thing about WordPress is actually, it's treated a bit like TripAdvisor, so we'll, we'll log on and we'll have a look, because the um, other developers who use the themes, they call it, will actually feed back and review them and let you know whether or not it was easy to work with. Um, you might decide to go to an agency. The idea of going to an agency is that they should have multiple skill sets. They'll have people who are um, designers, they'll have people who are programmers, they'll have people who are good at search engine optimization, they'll have people who are testers, um, they'll have people who are great at social media marketing. It's quite a competitive space to be in. It's quite difficult to run a digital agency, I would say, I've worked into and working in this area because there will always be somebody who will say that they've got a quote for £150 and how do you pay 10 people's wages at the end of the month and make a reasonable living out of building websites <coughs> when you're competing against square space of £10 a month, someone's going to build £150 a month. And then part of the problem is that we're addressing today is that the buyer community are not sufficient, sufficiently educated <coughs> to realise what's on the shopping list to build a robust, functioning, successful website. So when someone says, we'll put together web pages for you, and you think, oh look, and they have got presence. Whether they're fully optimised for search engine optimisation, whether it's actually usable or not, and functioning is, is a whole different subject matter. Um, then you've got a freelancer, which is, is much less expensive, because you've got one individual who quite often works from home, so you can get that a lot less money. But what will happen there is that they might have one core skill set that they, they're very, um, they lean towards design or they lean towards functionality or they do lean towards search engine optimization and I, and I think these are all viable options it's about what's fit for purpose and how much of the work you can or cannot do yourself so if you have a look here uh, pros and cons <coughs> of the least like square space is you know the, the, the upside is the pre-built templates um, there's no design or code required in your part they're generally quite simple to use there's online support some of live chat uh, Shopify's live chat is brilliant. The costs can vary on a monthly basis. They host it for you and they're always responsive. The, the downside is that you know it's limited. There's limited human interaction. You mentioned that when you were talking about your booking solution. Someone was saying, there was one that was at a Vivo or something, you can't speak to anybody. Mm -hmm. like, so the same thing is true when you have a hosted solution like um, GoDaddy or one one The search engine optimization is limited unless you pay more money. You can't add other functionality. <coughs> So if you go to an agency, quite often some of the website builds that I work on with an agency, that it'll be, um, the website will be integrated, it'll directly feed information into Sage Finance, for example. So there's programming, there's bespoke programming code required with that, but you can get that with an agency, but you can't get it with a hosted solution. So let, let me just take you, I'm going to go onto Squarespace and just um, show you what I'm talking about. So essentially, we are going to go into the Squarespace shop to shop for a website. There you go. Right. So you get free trial. I think you usually get a free trial for about a month. A lot of them will do a free trial. Um, and basically, you know, their call to action here is, just make that a little bit bigger, is to get started. They just they, they want you to sign up for an account. If I click here and look at templates, maybe. And they're usually categorised by sector. Right, so you've got popular designs, portfolios, photography, online stores, blogs, professional services, local businesses, events, weddings, musicians, bands, restaurants. So if we just go down and we'll pick restaurants. <coughs> so here are, here are the pre-built websites. Uh, we'll preview it. Which hopefully will eventually load. And it's saying here, look, if I click on these icons, I can see the desktop version, the mobile, and the phone version. And the idea is that you then log into this, and you would replace the logo up there with your logo. You could change these words, these calls, I think it's obviously still loading, and you can change the navigation over there. And you, can, and you don't have to write code to embed the Instagram or the Twitter icons, you just have to take the address of your Twitter account and add it. It's a form filling exercise. It's really very simplistic. And obviously you would expect that you would upload your own image as well so that it, it looks by the time you've changed it you might um, increase the font size you might change the color scheme and add an image but it looks completely different it looks like your website so those vary in price from let's 
starts at ten pounds a month. Oh, there, there we go. Right, okay. So ten pounds a month, and then it gives you an idea of all the different functionality that you get with it. Got up to fifteen, twenty, and thirty pounds, and it's cheaper if you pay for it annually. And they have a fantastic. Well, okay. They have an okay YouTube channel. It's mostly people talking to you about the things that you can do. Unlike Shopify, that I'm going to talk about next. But it's actually some, it's a, it's a screen, screen recording of someone going in and out of the content management system and making changes and uploading images. The Shopify um, content is far superior. Right. So we move over to Shopify and they specialise in e-commerce. But they do have an app, an add-on for reservations. I don't know a huge amount about it, but I do know that they've got that. Um, it's <coughs> they, they are, in fact, I've put this up here, haven't I? Um, Shopify are one of the market leaders of e-commerce themes. So you've got WooCommerce here, which is an e-commerce, and that's a plugin and add-on to WordPress that we've not talked about yet. Okay. So, so these guys have talked the game, and you can find a lot of reports like this online. So I, we're at the stage now where we're talking about buying, and I would definitely go to this with a TripAdvisor mentality, whether it's an agency, a freelancer, or whether it's one of these pre-built solutions. What's their market share? Who have they built websites before? How many customers do they have? What kind of feedback do they get? These guys have very good live chats, um, live chat online support. Whenever I've been stuck in the content management system or working with a client, they're on their game right away. It's really is fantastic. Yeah, and they have a brilliant checkout experience as well. So, hello, Sky. They, they are YouTube. This basically here is a video on YouTube that lasts. It's a 30 minute video. Right. But if you had, let's just say, you've gone your desktop and you had your iPad here or your phone, it basically takes you screen by screen. Have you used it? They're amazing. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> and they're, they're, these ones are so good. I can't say enough good things about the Shopify platform and the amount of um, tutorial that you get with it. Right. So those are two examples of least websites. You pay a fee every single month. They host it for you. Security is fantastic because they host hundreds of thousands of websites. It's their business. Right? So if they have a breach, bad news for them. Okay? And now we're going to move into this world of using WordPress, which is self-hosted. So you can either download WordPress, so it's a content, it's essentially a database. All of the websites now are built in a database, a database that stores pages, words, images, video. Right? And the intelligence says that when you open up a web browser, it presents it in a beautiful format. So WordPress is this open source community. It's free to download and install. Lots of <coughs> agencies use WordPress, right? So if we've got here, and, and there's a variety of reports, they never say the exact same thing, right? The usage of WordPress versus things like Joomla and Drupal and Magento and Shopify is, they have 30% and these guys are all much less. And there's a whole variety of reports that will have a similar-ish market share going on. Drupal is, is fine. But when I'm, if I'm putting a website out to tender and marking that with someone, and one of the suppliers come back saying um, Drupal, and someone comes back saying WordPress, and there's another one in there that's not listed as Umbraco, I will often lean towards WordPress because it's easier to find other staff. It's easier to find the skills if you have an issue with that agency to move somewhere else. So it's, it's just it's a, it's a risk factor. It's just a de-risk factor. So let me take you and show you around what happens in the WordPress world. <coughs> da, da, da. Um, let me see. Oh, this is good. I'll log in there just now and I'll come back with you because my website's built in WordPress. So if I put in WordPress farm shop theme into Google, WordPress has a much wider range of sector-specific pre-built websites than any other of the platforms. So I took you down the um, Squarespace and you saw the list down here on the left-hand side. Yes, my, I could replace that word there, WordPress farm shop theme, WordPress construction company theme, WordPress training company theme, WordPress swimming lessons theme, you name it, there's usually a theme for it. So if we go here, Theme Forest is one of the most popular places you can buy it. I'll take that down a wee bit. Oh, wait a minute, what happened there? Apologies. Right, so, it's like going into Amazon to buy um, a new camera. So here we are, the whole list here. 
Uh, WordPress theme, that's, that's, I think that might be a sponsored one. Organis is an organic store with co the e-commerce theme, and it's currently filtered by best sellers. I could refilter it by newest trending. I could look at the cheapest one. And if I scroll down, da, 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 here we go. So this theme here costs $60. It's been sold already to 133 other developers and individuals who want to use it to build their website. And it's got four out of five, it's got 11 reviews. Right, so moving a bit further. Oh. Okay, there's not a lot of choice then. <laughs> and, and inside this particular shop is it we are theme for is there's not a lot of choice for farm shops. But so if I click here to have a preview, uh, live preview, then I can have a look around this virtual website and I can go back and look at my site map and my wireframes and think about what is it that I want my website to do. Sorry, it's still loading. And does this match what I need? Now, it's not laid out just quite the same way as Shopify or Squarespace, because what you get here is, and this is usually what a developer would be interested in. Your suite's been open, so be on your game. You might have to do something here. No, nothing, there's no such things if you win. Right? Um, it shows you that there's different page formats, and there'll be different blog formats. So there's quite, this can be the downside of it if you're going to learn this yourself. There can be quite a lot of choice within the theme. Right? So there'll be different ways that you can lay out your, your blog. But it's for $60, it's actually really good value for money. So my website's on a WordPress theme. I picked a theme with my husband. I'm not going to do it myself. He's a web developer. And he then was saying, no, you have to narrow this down. There's eight different page layouts. Let's pick one page layout so it looks like the supermarket and everyone can find their way around. But it's great. It's great from um, that point of view. So let, let me just... Do another WordPress um, accommodation theme. Okay. Right, so here, so this is different, there's a bigger choice here. So I've put in WordPress accommodation theme. You can see that one has been bought 272 times. It's got almost five stars. That's 232 times. Um, so that one's 339 times. So a developer, as a developer, this is the type of thing that my husband would look at initially. Huh? And he's going to look and see, and, he, and he'll read the reviews, because other developers will comment on things that were difficult to do, or things that didn't work. And then in terms of the add-ons, so if I put in, uh, let me see, event, calendar. And these are in WordPress, we talk about this as a plugin. Right, so that's really just a blog with all the plugins. That was not a good one to pick. Mm. We'll try this one. Usually they're listed in a similar way in that, um, right, okay, so you, yeah, so this is what I want to see. This plugin, this events calendar, has been has been installed on websites over 800,000 times. So these are sometimes the issues. So even when I'm working with an agency who have multiple staff, who have different skill sets, and I'm building a WordPress website, I say, oh, you need an event calendar. Oh, yeah, that's fine. And then I go back to the test website, I think, that event calendar looks rubbish. And then I go and look up, and I'm like, it's been installed 10 times. It's got two stars out of five. Mm -hmm. Why did you pick that? Because look, here's one here. It's got, so it's had 1,334 uh, gold stars reviews. So I've kind of labored on a bit more about WordPress than the other ones, but this is what I love about it, that the community all feed back, and you can actually find out what is good functionality versus um, a, another piece of functionality. But doing it on your own, I think it's quite difficult to learn. So if you go along. Right. So this is the login for my WordPress website. Some of the themes need updated. That's I have to speak to my maintenance manager about that. And there's quite a long menu here down the side. And a lot of that functionality, my business doesn't actually need. I would say on Shopify and Squarespace that the interface, the content management system, where you would log in to change the menu, <coughs> add prices, add images, is much simpler than WordPress. But you know, it's um, just one of these things you would get used to over time. 
And I can go in here and go to every page of my website. Now, let me do something else. Let me do, um, let's type in, what will we type in? Something simple. Black leather jacket. Right. So we'll do a little bit of search engine optimization. <coughs> okay. Every single web page that lives on the internet has a title that tells search engines what that page is about. It has a URL, the address of the page, and it has a snippet of information for you as the user to read to decide when you see the search results if that's the right page for you. Right? Not all of these leased platforms like Wix, unless you're paying extra money, or GoDaddy, allow you to fully manage how you appear in the search results. Search engine optimization is a massive subject that we could spend a whole day on. But the very basics of getting it right is to start with labeling. Now, the title is not always necessarily what appears on the page. So let me go back to um, my website that I have logged into somewhere. Where did I log into? Here, right, okay. And try and pick one that I might have done properly. <laughs> Oops, right, market. So if I click edit, if I, I was, so I was just getting some extra screen grabs and things from my slides and doing a bit of research. And what I'm about to show you here on WordPress is a plugin called, look here, Yoast SEO for managing your search engine optimization. And you will find in a lot of resources, it gets the best write up across all website platforms for the easiest and best tool for managing your search engine optimization. Where I win and edit and manage how I appear in search engine results. So I can create a title, I can create the end of the URL, the web address, so mywebsite.com forward slash marketing dash consultancy, and I can write the description. That's sometimes the limitation you get with things like Wix and Weebly, is that they don't give you as easy functionality like this. Yoast takes it a step further, because it will tell you if you've used too many words or not enough words, and it will give you a score. I'm actually at an amber just now, not good. I need a green, because it will check this, against the words that you've written on the actual page to tell you whether or not you're hitting, you're maximizing or optimizing your search engine optimization. So it's these differentials that come into play when you're starting to think, what will I build my website on? And it's great, you go, oh, I can get a month's trial over here, that's $5.99 a month. Or someone else that you're working with, a friend and friend is going to put together a few pages. They might not do this, and therefore you will not get found, right? It's competitive, as Andrew said, but labelling is very, very important. So, questions so far? <coughs> no, we're still we're still. <coughs> right. What was the name of that of your plugin there? Yoast. Yoast SEO. Yoast. Is that Y O A S T? Yoast SEO. Okay. <coughs> what What do people think about? Like, is this kind of opening your eyes to the amount of things you need to consider? <coughs> In a website, and you can see why Sasha's looking at me funny, but um, no, it is. Yeah, because you can see why you could go for like, you know, I don't mean it's always related to price, but you can see if people are actually going to do everything correctly to build your website, there's quite a lot involved mm -hmm. rather than somebody that just sticks up something and then they've not. Uh -huh. I think it. it's good as well because if you are going to go and employ someone to do your website, you can ask. Questions and say these words, and they'll think you know what you're talking about. <laughs> and you can look at it on YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. learn the whole thing and just treat yourself. No, but I think that's my key objective for all of you. You can now make sure someone is building your website is doing it right. Yeah, that's my key objective for all of you today is to buy. That's one of the objectives: buy with confidence and be able to have these conversations and and expect to get an answer back. If someone says, "Oh, it doesn't matter," it does matter. Um. I'm sure you're going to cover it later on, but from my li very limited experience of websites, this is a, it's a bit of a minefield, but I've kind of got my head around the WordPress thing, as has my wife, so we oh, can good. manage that's it. good, that's good. And we've got Yoast, and we've got all these things, so that's a positive. What I find is really difficult when we've gone out to get another designer to launch, a, uh, create a new website, new design, is actually getting the photography and the content for it, because that's the thing that folks see, folk, Mm -hmm. actually go to the website, it's the photography and the content, 
that neither of us are creative enough to mm -hmm. come up with good imagery or good words. And then you've not only got the cost of the web design, but you've got a potentially huge cost of getting photography and getting somebody to copyright. You mentioned earlier, Caroline, to actually, they've got to come and understand the business, they've got to get it right. And we're the people that probably know it best, but we can't portray it in the way that buyers want it to be portrayed to them. So I, how do you I think overcome yeah. the cumulative effect of a website yeah. and the cost? I think, I think it absolutely does have to be a, a team effort because you're right, you know your business better than anyone. And I think a photographer who's invested mm. in, in doing a good job for you will say things like, oh, where's the best view? Or mm -hmm. what's the most popular site, bit of the site? What do people always ask you about? What are you most proud of? And help you put together. Certainly, so Carol and I um, did a photo shoot. There was a big list. There was a, there was a list put together of what was going to be photographed. Then there was another list of what had to be bought and where it would be put to be photographed. And then the order in, everyth in which everything had to be photographed. Um, so we had, for example, like don't just photo. You might want like a photograph of like I don't know, the bedroom with the cushions on the bed and what it would normally look like. But then you might want a photograph which like we staged. You know, I don't know. We had like a couple of made a champagne bottle and some two shoes off and. You know, I mean, it doesn't matter. I'm not going all that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we had like we 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 bought a lobster that day, and we had, um, you know, we had a table set up with lovely food on it, and that he was taking the photo of the hot tub through the thing. So some of the photographs were functional. This is what the barbecue looks like, and others were yeah, arty farty yeah. ones. Your he what they call hero shots oh. for for your website, mm. but. But yeah, a list is a good idea so that when you, the photographer's gone home and you go, God, I don't have pick, I've forgotten the bathroom picture, and a list is good in these. And seasonal ones that. as well. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I hope you don't mind me saying though, I think, because we, we had a few issues, didn't we? And I think that what fell down there was, the, we had the list, but I think we ended up with too much. And if the web people were working more closely with us, we could have had a, a much tighter, we could have probably done a day instead of three days and had a much tighter list. So I think that that's something that you can all learn from, is that really, if you've done the site map and you've got the plan, really think about how many photographs I need and what do I need, and, and then shop around. You know, it's a, it's a bit like the website thing as well. Shop around, don't just go with the first person that's referred to you. Ask them where they've worked before. I get into trouble for saying this at a workshop, but I'm, just, I'm still gonna say it. Get in touch with the local colleges and universities. I was going to say, there's so many amateur photographers that are quite good. Yeah. If you offer them a discount on your place, mm -hmm. they'll, yeah. come and they'll come and do it at the If they bring their portfolio mm -hmm. along and, and show you their portfolio. Or a lot of the students, especially in final year, actually need a live project to pass the final module or whatever that might be. Um, so they need a live living business. And it's very difficult. I've been involved with the universities. It's difficult to attract businesses to come in and let the, that business get businesses who want to work with um, What's the uh, format and ideal pixel count or whatever? Right, so you we're talking about a DSLR, you know, the ones with the big chunky... Yeah, yeah, like, but I mean for high. uploading, quick upload mm -hmm. on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, so so um, size, of, size of food for... Um, yeah, size... The, the, it's it's got to go down from being megabits to kilobytes. Mm -hmm. right, it's got, you've got to, you, you can, you've got to reduce it, but you've got to start with the chunky image first, with the quality, because you've got depth, because what might happen as well is you would crop, so you get some, a whole batch of images back and you think, actually that bit of this image is really, really good, so you want to be able to crop that and maintain, and retain the quality of that image, so it's got to come down from, a lot of these raw images will probably, you'll find a little big eight, eight megabytes, so if you save them to your um, computer, and, and view them as a list, you will just show you the file size. And, and I certainly know my Mac, I just have to double click and it opens a thing called preview, and I can actually just go in and change the dimensions and take it down. So if it's kilobytes, then it's gonna speed up rather than loading megabytes. One of the things I think that we didn't do well in our photos was that uh, I think it's, they took lots of lovely pictures of the farm and the accommodation and the animals and the view. We didn't get any of us. And at the time we were doing photos for the self care then on the farm mm -hmm. and that worked great. But I really want professional photos mm -hmm. for farm tours now and the human side. It's amazing how many times sometimes one want, wants a picture of you. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm out there trying to get my selfie for Airbnb to make their like <laughs> experience things and they've got all these rules about you know you can't look at it and I've got my chicken and it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> just like oh and you can't get a good picture of a chicken without it looking slightly evil but uh, but that but that was just as as if anyone's get getting off talk about don't forget to put yourself oh, in yeah. some of the photos because yeah. I've not got to kind of try exactly. and get that yeah, done exactly. again. The, the other thing uh, to, so, so the question about the words is that generally when you get a theme and a template of your website, right, so you've got... So this is, let's just say this is the home page and you can scroll down and this is the bit that's above the fold. Um, there'll, be a, there'll be a placeholder for an image here and there'll be a placeholder for words here and then there might be an image and an image and an image. And this is copy again. There's usually only so much space that you can write in so there'll, there'll be a limited amount of copy that you can create and if you're working with an agency they should give you a word count because you can and this is what happens when people use themes they write too much and it offsets the images here so it starts to look like a homemade website it looks poor so you've got a limited word count and then you have to think about what is it that people actually want so again sorry to use your example but to our agency brought us this copywriter he's a fantastic and a really lovely guy but he wrote you know it was like um like romantic novel type copy, but people are going to say, is, like there, is, there, is there a bath? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bullet point, bath, shower. You know, so there's some, some of the copy is very functional and it doesn't have to be like Mills and Boons. Keep that back for your blog. So if you actually go through the pages that we've created in the site map and say, you know, what's the purpose, what's the goal, what does someone want from it? Directions, <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. Or how much does it cost? What is it? It's a two night minimum stay. So what is it? It's a four bedroom cottage with a spectacular view of XYZ. That's exactly what it is. Um, facilities include, those are bullet points. Uh, it's a two, here are the rules, a two minimum stay check and it's two leave at four. Quite a lot of the copy is really functional. So but just as an example again, so now as we have a uh, frequently asked question, but we also have what you need to bring in and what we provide. And that's one of the things that the folks say is the most useful bit of the website mm. is that they can look at that and see actually we provide all cutlery, crocky, blah, 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 but we need to bring tea towel or whatever it might be. Mm. And they say the company they say it's really useful to have that information yeah. just as a list. Mm. And uh, yeah, but it comes back to the, the kind of sexiness of what you write actually is how you how we draw people that don't think like Jillian and I into the website because that's what we've come up against before is that we can write things that are how we see it but actually we're writing it from our perspective yeah. as an owner as a business mm -hmm. not as somebody coming in fresh to just mm. you know. why don't you ask some of your customers say, how they yeah. see you like ask them for help say you you're doing your website can you please help me can you yeah. describe mm -hmm. what, what what pages would that be on for example, so what page? Give me a, give me an example of a page that you need that type of copy for. Um, so well, I suppose for the the, the kind of home page we're selling it, uh -huh. and then the the safari tents just to, as a kind of selling the experience of a safari right, tent, okay. rather than the, the functional bullet point. But it's the how we dress it up and make it really appealing to the family that want to get away for a weekend and away from technology and detox okay. and. So I just described what you wanted to have on your page. Just said it out loud. Yeah, but then I can't bloody type that quick. <laughs> <laughs> that I spent, <laughs> most of my consultancy <laughs> engagements are spent asking people questions and I write down exactly what they say. And then I just give them, I'm like, you said that. <laughs> like, well, that's lovely. And I'm like, I know, but you said it. <laughs> so, it's, so it's quite, that's the other thing that I, I find. Because I, I work alone. This, so this is my Christmas night out, better behave oh. all of you. Oh, Dwayne, who did that? <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on. This is my Christmas night out as well. Oh, God, it better be good. <laughs> <laughs> it's all on you. <laughs> um, but no, when I, I, so I work with a lot of people who work on their own and I explain to them, it's quite difficult to be creative on your own. Like, this is not building something. This is not out harvesting. That you're now being, it's not doing bookkeeping. This is creativity. You're using a different side of your brain. And it's difficult to do it on your own, but it's easier to do it with people. So if, if someone said, you know, said, oh, well, let's go and write all the website copy, you know, I keep veering off to Facebook and it's a bit boring. But if I sit with them and ask them about their business, and actually usually the person I'm interviewing gets quite emotive and quite passionate, it becomes really easy to write the copy because we're doing it together and we're feeding off one another. So I, that might be a suggestion is to try and do it with someone else. 
The other thing is, if you haven't got a big room full of pals that are taking you out for dinner, is if you've got, for example, 10 items... Caroline didn't realise she was my pal until now. You've really put under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realise I was taking you out for dinner. This <laughs> <laughs> is it. <laughs> If, it, if it, there's ten items that you think that you want to create some chat about, list them out, and go and have a look at what other people write, and yeah. write down the names of two or three websites and the diatribe that they've. But used don't don't lift all their copy though. From that. <laughs> no, use no, use it as explanation. There'll be use words that. in there that you can translate and put into mm -hmm. your own story. <coughs> that way, that but you I, but actually, that part. that's a branding question as well. You know, whether you use words like exclusive, because if you use, use words like exclusive, that usually suggests luxurious, which usually means a high price tag. So, so language is really important. So that the adjectives, the adjectives and descriptions that you use to help set the scene. So I, I'm not going to hog it too long. I do want to ask another question. This is something that I always wonder about ourselves. Can you oversell yourself in a website and then people are disappointed when yes. they arrive? Yes. Can, or can you, as I feel, I we do, slightly undersell ourselves on our website and people arrive and go, oh wow, this is much yeah. better than uh -huh. I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. Is that because I'm not portraying it well enough on the web? Or is it because actually I'm doing the right thing and giving them not such high expectation that they're going to be disappointed when they get there? I can see the advantage mm -hmm. of everybody being over delighted when they arrive. But we actually, we live in a world now where people boast. It's a lot of what happens in social media all the time. So this is my favourite example of the past month. I you know, as you know, I deliver branding workshops and things about being social and social media. And I spoke, speak to people about control your own conversation. This is the best example of someone trying to control their conversation and their brand. It was Kanye West on Twitter. Did you see it? Mm -hmm. Kanye West on Twitter. I might never be skinnier or taller, so I'll just settle for being the best artist in the world. <laughs> and I thought, well, kind of good on him, fine. Yeah. The point being, if you're not going to say it about yourself, how can you respect others? And we live in a world where we do, it's not very Scottish, so, and it's, I was probably even, I think it's called, it's called marketing, it's not called boasting, but I'm, I'm explaining to you that we boast more than we used to 10 years ago. So if you're not going to do it, then do it. See, I'm really good at marketing. <laughs> <laughs> <Just, laughs> can I just say one thing, we've got to be careful of you. So we had somebody recently set up, I'm not going about it because I'm just bursting into tears. Um, but, um, it's going to be some night. <laughs> and Poppy does directly and took our words that we oh. work a lot on <laughs> off our website. But that is copyrighted, your words that you've paid for and you've thought of. So just be careful if you're, you can take phrases, you can take inspiration of other people's websites, but do not lift their text because that's mm. now illegal. And is copyrighted something you have to do on top, or is it automatically <coughs> copyrighted once you've set up a website with those words on it? Well, is, well yes, but it's not, well, Google index web pages, date time stamped. So if somebody uses the exact same copy, they, they treat they that as a copy, right? right? So they, they just think that some, someone's copied that, but you were the originator of that, right. that content, so it's bad from that point of view. Um, I don't know to what extent, it depends what the words are, you know, if it's kind of flowery and loose. If it's, it's a specific product, then it probably will be very much infringement of, of copyright. Product name, product description, yes. And presumably we've got to get those keywords in there as well somewhere in, I mean, so on which page do they come but, but the keywords, But the keywords are very simplistic. So the, the best report I read about search engine optimisation was from HubSpot that said, write search engine optimisation copy for human beings, not for algorithms. So if it is a two-bedroom cottage, it is a two-bedroom cottage. Right? That, that's exactly what it is. People are looking for self-catering cottages, self-catering cottages near the sea. So you call it exactly what the product is, which generally quite often will match exactly what people are looking for. And does it matter which page it's on, or is it as long as it's on one of the pages on your website? And it does matter because it should be on the page that's about the two-bedroom cottage, and not the page that's about the four-bedroom cottage, and not the page that's about the apartment, or the page that's about the tent. It should, the image should match, the header should match, and the copy should all match thematically. Because that's what would happen in a department store. So if you take it back to the offline tangible world, shops that get it right, I mean, there, there will be, this time of year, there's a shop that pops up everywhere, isn't there, that does the um, three rolls of paper for a pound and as many gift bags. And they're chaos, those shops. You only put up with it because it's a pound. But they're horrible shops. And it's quite hard to find things. Did someone say, who got the ferry? Was it from Aaron? Did someone come from, where did you come from? 
Yeah. Megan Fizz. Because an hour and I discovered there was this shot. Just so this so sorry, gentlemen. It still is a thing that you put at either side of your bra when your bra doesn't fit. Right? But it's like next to postcards <laughs> and paper clips and pens. And I was like, to husband, oh my god, what kind of shop even is this? It's, it's kind of amazing and weird all at the one time. Right? It's chaos. But good shops aren't chaotic. Right? All the lingeries together and all the food is together and all the canvases are together. Your web is just the same on your website. Can I say one thing? But do watch out for it. I'm having this thing over organic turkeys for Christmas. Oh. And you type in organic turkeys Scotland and a whole load of free range people come up. Mm -hmm. And they've clearly put organic in their search mm -hmm. terms. Mm -hmm. So that's wrong. How dare they? You know. <laughs> so in a way, you can have great words and you can have the right words uh -huh. for the page, mm -hmm. but someone else may have gone and nicked your words. It's, it's, about, it's about more than words. It's so yeah. Let's discuss this. Like, it's we've got the same instance where, uh, actually, your sisters, where there's this in more deep, 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 there's a place called St Andrews at Falkirk. It's the exact same as people using farms. The farm has been sold, the farmhouse has been sold, and there's still other services. Farm, farm, farm bed and breakfast, yeah. mm -hmm. farm self catering. Mm -hmm. They are technically right, they're in a farmhouse, but they I are think not that's where working you might get the traffic to you at that time, but then once they realise there is no view of the loft, yes, we're in about five miles radius and we're not coming back here, whereas our selling point is yes, we will have a picture literally of. Right. Let me explain this to you. Search engine optimization. You 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 get scores for search engine optimization from Google and Bing and Yahoo. Okay, but it's all weighted. So certain elements of your search engine optimization are worth more than other elements. See this bit here that says fifty percent, circa fifty percent. Guess what that is? Words. So it's only worth about fifteen percent, but you've got to get it right. You can't have a picture on a page that's all about organic turkeys and then say it's actually BMW cars. It doesn't match, right? You will get nowhere. So um, Doogie sort of brought this up at the start, so let's bring it full circle. Oh. The most popular activity on the web before social media was pornography. pornography. Right. <laughs> I didn't directly bring up. <laughs> 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 you went there, I was looking at furniture. Actually. You're doing, <laughs> we're doing this kind of telepathy thing. Right, so, <laughs> and, and when, and when, in the, the late 90s, when I first worked in um, web development and you had search engines called things like Alpha Vista, um, search engines were very immature and they didn't really have a lot of rules. So, um, the first thing that the, whoever had the search engine thought of was, oh, it'll be the domain name. So, and, and I, I was the oldest member of the team, I was 28, and I had all these lovely young, it was mostly men, programmers and designers, and they would just say stupid things like, Leslie, Leslie, go and look up uh, BMW Cars Glasgow, and I'd be like, what's BMW Cars Glasgow? Got nothing to do with cars, it's all porn, the double up. <laughs> <laughs> because it didn't matter, and as, as search engines have matured, they've come up with a lot of very sophisticated rules. Very basic, simple rule is, that if the title of the page says, BMW Cars Glasgow, there should be at least be a picture of a car and it should talk about cars that are the brand BMW. Right? So it's about so getting your copy and your words correct is the number one priority. So at least that when Google finds your web page it knows what's it's like the yellow pages, it knows where to slot you in, right? But there's so many other elements. Andrew talked about the views. Your reviews and your reputation might be worth four or five percent. Nobody really knows this is this is the search engine's intellectual property. Right. So and, and other and he mentioned Moz. So Moz are a specialist search engine optimization company who provides software, usually to bigger agencies, and they test web pages. So they run all of the rules and scenarios to test how Google's working and what changes or not they've made and things that you might need to change to your website to rank. So this is this it could be all day, but for example, probably somewhere between probably around about 25% roughly of your entire score is backlinks, other independent websites or web pages that link back to your web pages in a favourable manner. Right? So um, you've been listed on the BBC Good Food Guide 
right? or the uh, Guide to the Michelin Star Cafes of Scotland, whatever it might be, their website has linked back to your website. And, it, and it's a bit like a TripAdvisor review to Google. If that web page is good enough, that so many other web independent domain names have linked back to it, you get a big tick. So it's not just about the words, but the words are important. And it's something, again, we could spend all day, but, but this is something you acquire over months that you build up, you build up the legacy. So somebody mentioned this morning about, oh yes, you mentioned about the farm website and the story and what to do with the accommodation. So over the lifespan of that website, as you've, if you've, as you've added new content and people have come to the website, because another slither, I'm not very good at maths, right? I'm going to say that's 7%. Google uses Google Analytics on everyone's website, whether you've signed up or not. So it'll be monitoring how many people come, how long they stay, how many repeat visits you get, and your score will be accumulating. So all of those web pages have a value that you don't want to just chuck out. And that's really important <coughs> as well when you build a new website. You want to be able to redirect the old web pages to the new web pages so you take some of your score with you. Does that make sense? Oh, hello. Ooh, it's called a 301. Is it a 304 or a 301? I think it's a 301 redirect. 301, yeah. yes. Right. Do you have to have both live? No, no, no. So what happens, it's like it's a, it's a forwarding address at the post office. So what happens, it's, it's, it, you can, it's easy to do in WordPress because there's usually just a wee form that says uh, 301 and you paste in the old address and what you're doing is saying to Google, this web page that's new used to live here, so everything you learned and you loved about it, please pass to this web page. Yeah, sometimes you, you'll click on a site and I'll do that on the screen and then you go to another click. So, so that's a redirection, yeah. right? But it doesn't know it doesn't have to be live. Like, how did we get to that bit? How did, how did we get from WordPress? Oh yes, it was all about copy, well done. Did, did I answer your questions? Yes, Copy now, you. Right, okay. Any other questions? What's the end for what? Oh, right, okay. What's Thanks. that big black bit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Loads of things. Loads of things. We've <laughs> got analytics. Um, speed might be included in there, or speed might be here. Um, what other kind of things? Uh, What's the anchor? The, the anchor text, right. So, because I'm not getting any SEO slides with me. You know when you're reading a body of copy on a website and there's a phrase that might be in blue with an underline and you know if you click on it, mm -hmm. it takes a hyperlink, thank you. The, the words on the hyperlink are called anchor text. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh. That right. So, and these will seem really, really simplistic, but people got us wrong all the time. Um, if the anchor text says something like, uh, oh, let's see, uh, directions to the hideaway and you click on it, what do you expect the next page to be about? Oh, yeah. right, um, okay, people get things like that all the time. How to get here, and then you click on it. Now, it's, it's still kind of thematically the same, but people use lots of different phrases, and it's not labelled properly. So what Google says is, that if you don't have the right anchor text, well, so anchor text can be worth 20 to 25%, because you've got to remember, this is a piece of software it's a machine, not a human being, that is reading its way around these web pages, trying to make sense of it. So one of the most common phrases used in anchor text for hyperlinks is called click here. So you can imagine if Google is a human, it's sitting there going, well, the humans, they really like the click here's. They'd use a lot of the click here's. I don't know what it looks like, but it's really it's so fascinating. They use it everywhere they go, because it doesn't describe what the next page is about. So it's got to be, it's labelling, it's going up and down the lift in Marks and Spencer's, it is common sense. So can you, for example, search on Google, and for Google, Google. <laughs> sorry I'm thinking about Google, <laughs> Google, um, um, common hyperlinks, or, you know. No, no, it's common work? sense, it's what, like, so, so if you're going to link from an, one page to the next, yeah. then it's, it's, it's how you describe that okay, page. Right. But, like, I'm going to show you another example. So basically, for example, if I had a, on my page where I was talking about our cattle, you can order, order beef would be my hyperlink in uh -huh. blue, and that would link to the beef ordering page. That uh -huh. would be a good Rather than architect. order now or order here, you'd yeah. say order, order beef. beef. Right. Order okay. beef online. Or even that's what's happening. So, mm -hmm. book accommodation. You can have yeah. p external web pages. Now, let's see. This is um, Leslie, and this is Caroline. This is Caroline's website and this is Leslie's website. So I can link to Caroline's website and pages in my website can link to other pages in my website and they are all linked by anchor text 
And that's the words that Google uses to make sense of where the link is going to and what the link is about. Right? Because in the past, people would spam. They would use the URL, Glasgow, BMW Cars Glasgow, to try and draw you in, and then you're on a porn website. Or they would use something like, um, so for some reason, I keep seeing these things all the time on the web. I shouldn't really admit this either, because something must be going on. It's always like, 10 signs, you might have cancer. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> And then you go off, and it's like, if you fill in all this information, you might get 50 quid for Tesco. I'm like, what, 50 quid for Tesco? I thought it was dying a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> so it's spam, because they're using the wrong language, right? and they're spamming people, right? So, yeah. so this is where... Articles and stuff. Right. That you yeah, all right. So this is where all these rules... So all those pages, lots of articles and adverts, and... They, they, they do not score well in terms of Google. Right? So let, let me give you an example. Um, so I could link from my website into Caroline's website, and Google's expecting that that would be something sensible. Right? There are two hotels in Edinburgh that are owned by the Heritage Portfolio Group, and or two venues, rather. One is called Mansfield Chaquair, which is an outskirts of Edinburgh that does luxury weddings. Right? And one is the Signet Library, where they also run luxury weddings. And the Heritage Portfolio went to an agency and they built two websites um, of a similar look and feel. Obviously, the venues are completely different. Very similar wording, but not exactly the same, but all about luxury weddings. And they invested in a lot of search engine optimization. And they came and said to me, if you type in luxury weddings venue Edinburgh, Mansfield Repair is on page one, and the Signet Library is dying a death on page five. But we've done the same amount of work, we just don't understand what's going wrong. And I thought, because I'm a genius. It's like, it'll be the backlinks. Bring it, you know, come over, give me all the paperwork. I suspect the one in page one has got uh, lots of backlinks, and the one in page five doesn't have that many backlinks. Because they've got all the words right, but the words are only worth 15%. So they brought me these reports from this company, Moz, that do all this really sophisticated um, data about your website performance. And the one in page one had 2,000 backlinks. And then I went to look at the one in page five, and it had 3,000 backlinks. It's like, oh, ah, I was like, oh my God, they're coming in half an hour and I don't know the answer. <laughs> I wish I had, but I was like, ah, it's be fine, you see me. And then I went through all of the backlinks, right? And the anchor text and all the backlinks to the one in page five talked about the Law Society. The Law Society owned the Signet Library. So they say the Law Society, the Law Society, events and conference centre at the Law Society, the Law Society, the Law Society, the Law Society. The one in page one with less backlinks had lots of things in the Scottish wedding directory, wedding venue, luxury weddings. The machine that is Google said, oh, that's definitely about weddings. So if people Google it, because independently everyone's called it a wedding, I'll show it in page one, that this has got something to do with law. I'm not going to look at that on page five, because it's a machine. And it's now search engine optimization. So do you have to take all the off then, or how do you, what do you, how do you sort that? You could sit down and contact the other 2,000 people and ask them to change the word, but they've probably written some blog or article that wasn't anything to do with a wedding. So you then need to say, well, what's the tactic? Maybe we'll run a paid ad for that one, or do more social media marketing. Right? So, so it's a bit more than the words. Right? Is that? Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. So we've talked about learning something like WordPress, uh, leasing a website, or going to an agency. <coughs> and this has become quite a popular phrase in the last two or three years, because they talk about they're the full stack agency. Mm -hmm. That means they do everything, they're really clever. <laughs> and they do search engine optimization, social media marketing, video photography, programming, design, da, 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 da. Um, Full stack agencies are expensive because they have a lot of staff on a salary every single month, so it does cost a lot of money, but they have a lot of skills. How to approach it is you need to write a brief. You still need to go through a degree of that planning exercise and tell them exactly what the type of functionality you're expecting to get, what your goals are. I always put this in a brief. How much money you expect that website to make in the next 12 to 18 months and that you expect the website to pay for itself. Right. So it should not cost you more money for the website than the return that you're expecting to get. You need to tell them who your customers are about your business, the websites that you like, how quickly or not that you want to build, you need to get at least three quotes. And then compare the technology that they propose to you, what their previous experiences of similar websites, and the analytics, the performance of their customers' websites. They should be able to demonstrate that they built successful websites for previous clients and that they made money back on that. And this is where all of it should be treated like TripAdvisor. <laughs> testimonials, reviews, references from previous clients, 
what do other people think of them? And if they can't provide that, then I, I will go with them. The benefit is that it's bespoke to an extent. Most of them might use something like WordPress or they might use something like Drupal or Joomla that is an, a pre-built content management system that has page designs in it. They may have developed their own platform based on something like Drupal or they may have their own platform. So they've part built a website already. They're not going to do it from scratch every single day. People who have websites from scratch are the Hilton or B&Q because they want to offer you some functionality where you can go in and tile your own bathroom virtually online. Right? So they've probably done a degree of the work first and you can have that conversation about whether most of your audience are likely to come from a mobile device or not and whether they start with a mobile design or not first. Okay? But they will have a favoured platform. Everybody in the company will know how to use Drupal and they'll tell you that Drupal is better than WordPress and they'll come up with loads of reasons why it's better or Joomla. But it's predominantly because that's, that's, that's the one that they know. It's usually not anything to do with the business case. Oh, that's okay, it's fine. But that, that's really important to sort of take that in. You know, because I mean, I'm, not, I'm not meaning MD in this room's daft, but um, you know, if you go and you think this person's an expert and they're saying, this is, this is the system, it's WordPress, you know what I mean? And you don't, that's what today's about, I guess, mm -hmm. but you don't, you know, you just take the you can take their word for it because you sort of deem them to be an expert, mm -hmm. but they might not. It might not be the best thing for you. So a, a thing that gets mentioned to me quite a lot when I go to an agency and they use something that's lesser popular, maybe like Drupal or Joomla, is WordPress is really insecure. It gets hacked a lot. It's dreadful. Blah 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 blah. It, WordPress is the market share across the Western world. Lots of websites do get hacked. It's about coming up with the right hosting solution and security and maintenance every month and that website being managed to stop that happening. It's a competitive industry, like I mentioned before. They're up against Squarespace and Shopify. And, and it's a bit like, to some degree, law and accountancy. There's a time-based billing system. I think it's quite a difficult industry sometimes to make money in. Um, so you just need to be aware of all of that. I think freelance is a really, really good option. It's a, it's a good option because generally they have a lot less overheads and unlike Squarespace, you actually get to speak to somebody face to face. You can work with someone and if you can find someone that you like and you get on with and you can both be honest with one another and they can say, do you know what, I don't really know an awful lot about search engine optimization, but I can build you a website that's got the functionality. If you want to go and learn, you can manage it. And you can go to one of these three-hour digital boost workshops and you can learn a pretty big chunk of it. And there are YouTube's a bit, you know, there are good tutorials on YouTube and there are ones that are terrible, but you probably could manage a lot of your search engine optimization on your own. Right? So with the combination of your skills and theirs, it can cost a lot less money. There is obviously the risk factor that they decide that they're a web developer today and then they completely change career the next day. And that's about the platform that you choose to work on and saying, you know, what would be the, I always ask that, what's the backup here? If you decide to go off into another career, you win the lottery, you have a bit of a fallout, how portable, how, how easy is this technology for someone else to pick up? How many other Drupal developers are there in within a 30 to 50 mile radius that live here that we could then get them to help work on and maintain the website? So those are things to be aware of. And then there's the testing. So we talked a bit about that this morning, about the user testing. You could just ask five of your friends and family to be fairly honest with you. Give them a task. Don't just say, what do you think? What do you think? You actually have to give them a task-based exercise to do. And then ask them, did they do it in their mobile phone? Did they do it in a tablet? Did they do it in a desk? That's their choice. We cannot control how people access our website. Do they use Chrome? Did they use Safari? How long did it take them to get? Did they enjoy it? Was it easy to use? And then ask them if there were any barriers, what were their barriers? And then you'll get an idea of how well it's working or not. But we all have access to this free tool called Google Analytics. So we're we'll log on and have a look. Who doesn't have Google Analytics? All right, so just... All right, okay, so you don't have <laughs> Right, okay, where have I put Google Analytics? Here we are, okay. Google Analytics is um, a free tool from Google. They give, they give you a small piece of code that you add to your website, and then it measures all sorts of activity on a daily basis of what happens <coughs> on your website. So if I go here to this client's website, and we'll just extend the date range to the 1st of October until now, and apply this. See? It tells me here that they have had 
18,176 users, so people who have visited the website. Some of them have visited it two or three times because it said the total sessions, the total visits is 23,000. They've visited an average of 4.2 pages. Well, that's a pretty good indicator, isn't it? They, they must like it, the 24 pages. Uh, well, this is, I thought I'd changed it to something else. I'm going to change, well, I'm going to change something else. Um, and they've stayed for three minutes. Right. <coughs> I was actually starting to get quite surprised there with those stats. I was like, oh my god, that's amazing. Uh, oh, so is that information available for any website, or do you have to log on to see specific stuff? No, no, it's only it's only for you. Right? You can't see. You can. They, they have a thing called benchmarking, which will tell you about your sector. Right. So here we go. Back, back to this one. Right? So this particular website has had. Uh, 5,730 users, some have come two or three times, so the total number of sessions is over 7,000 and that's from the 1st of October until now. They've, stayed, they've, oh, they've visited 6.52 pages, that's fantastic, and they've stayed for three and a half minutes. And a bounce rate, a bounce rate is when someone comes to one page and leaves immediately. So they have a bounce rate of 35%, which is, is actually extremely fantastic, but that they're, they're performing reasonably, reasonably well. People come and they enjoy being here, they stay for 3.34 minutes. Again, this, they do they do a half day workshop on this with Digital Boost, so this is something we could spend a lot of time on. If I click on, for example, mobile, and then click on overview, for that defined period of time that I've picked, it tells me that 48% of the traffic have come from a mobile device, 41% has come from a desktop, and 545 has come from a tablet. And then you can see correspondingly over here what the breakdown is of sales. So they make the most of their money, 60% of their money for that period has come from desktop sales. Right. So actually, the majority of the traffic, if you add up tablet and mobile, the majority has been on a, you know, a mobile device, but they don't convert as well. So that would suggest to me that there might be an issue with the user experience on those devices. Or quite often you find if you study it, some people just still prefer to buy on a desktop, they prefer to complete their transaction there. So we can see how that performs. I, I looked into this, Leslie, but yeah, the people, I think some of the research showed that people like would look at a mobile when they were on the bus or something, or, you know, and then they would still book their holiday when they got home on a, on a mm -hmm. com main computer. I do that. I, I, I do, I do that as well. I like to see the bigger full picture. I think, I think the younger generation though, probably does a lot of it on their phone. Yeah. I mean, I, I would do it on my laptop, but I feel maybe browse on my phone. It's, it's still an evolving mm -hmm. space. So, right, so, so now I've clicked on a thing called acquisition. So how did we acquire traffic to the website? So this is, this is part of the testing as well, right? And it says here that organic search, so they Googled something, is 66%. 15% of people knew the URL and typed in www. Social media brought nearly 12%, other re referring pages 4%, email campaign almost 2%, advertising there 0.2%. I uh, don't know what other is. And if I click on, I can click on these and I'll get a breakdown. So social, well actually, so it tells me that Instagram is the, be the highest performing social media platform for driving traffic back to the website. So you can test the website and you can test the website marketing and you can also test the search engine optimization because there's another tool called Google Search Console. Now I can't remember if this is, they might not have uh, integrated it. No, they, have, they haven't <coughs> integrated it. And, and Google Search Console, which is another free tool, and you can integrate them together, will tell you what people type in that triggers you to be shown in the search engine results page. And then it will tell you if you're on the first page, the second page, the third page, the fourth page, wherever that might be, okay? So you can think about the words that you've typed in that you hope are helping you get found and find out if any of those actually trigger you to be shown. And then you have a thing called a click-through rate. So you might be shown in the search engine results, but maybe no one clicks. And that's when you've got to think about that snippet that you've written under the URL. Was that, is it enticing? Will that entice people to come and click through on the page? Um, let's go back to audience here. They're spending six minutes on the page because they're trying to find a cheaper pair of socks for me to quit. <laughs> and they are pretty pricey, yeah. yeah. They're not cheap, but they're very, very good. So you've had a target market. I have, sure. a, I have a pair. I have, I have a pair. <laughs> right, so this is maybe I showed you this when I talked about customer journeys. Right, so I've got who's coming from the United Kingdom, United States, Canada, Germany, France, so where they come from. The forward slash 
always represents the home page. So the majority of the traffic all end up here, but there's a massive drop off rate. So we get a lot of people coming in. And I also, we learned at the start that there's quite a lot of new customers, but they're not staying, right? And I suspect that's because they've had the same cover image on their homepage of their website now for seven years. <laughs> so I've spoken to them about that numerous times. So there are a lot of free tools that you can use to test your website. Right. Uh, and that's Google Search Console. Hosting options. Generally what would happen if you release a website with Weebly or Squarespace, that's all built in. That's part of the monthly fee, so you don't need to think about that. Um, if you go with an agency, they would normally call, they would charge you an annual fee. They would rent server space somewhere, in a massive unit, could be in California, could be in Leeds, massive building that's kept temperature controlled, where they will buy some space and then they will sublet that space to you. You can arrange your own hosting and it can be fairly inexpensive, but that's generally where there's nobody to speak to at the end of the phone and it's quite difficult if the site goes down. And usually if you've got your domain name, your email address is tied to the domain name. I've been through all of these various scenarios, it's quite difficult. Um, I can't imagine a scenario where you would ever run your own server. I don't think that you would necessarily need to do that. Um, and usually now when you buy a domain name, www.mybusiness.com, you get a secure certificate as well. And you might see this when you browse the web. This impacts your search engine optimization. It also impacts how people feel about coming onto the website. And this is the type of thing where if the software needs updated, any security issues, that if you're with an agency, that's what they should be looking after for you on a monthly basis. But equally, if you're with Squarespace or Weebly, they would be doing that for you as well. Right? So we, ta we started to talk about this at the beginning. Either buy, plan, or manage your web presence with confidence. Figure out you know, what are the goals? How do you want to look? You need to be consistent. Just write a, write a list of it. It doesn't have to be a war and peace document about the functionality that you want to you require. Sketch it out roughly so that when you go and look for themes and templates in all these different places you can buy a website, or if you're working with a freelancer, so that you can choose it together. Because I've been through these many, many scenarios. I usually get sent in after someone's bought a website and it's not working out, and they'll say, no, but they said we had to have this theme. Right? And that's maybe because they've already bought it or they've already used it and they like using it and they can do it quick and easy. Therefore, and, and fair enough, right? They can do it quicker than if you pick something else, which means they'll make a higher profit from the job. Um, you need to think about your search engine optimization. That this is really about the platform that's picked. You can take part in your testing. There's a lot of this essentially that you can learn to do yourself. And I think that's something you need to think about today. But whether you're going to look at Weebly or Squarespace or even GoDaddy, and we'll talk about in a minute, you have to take that TripAdvisor approach. You're not the first people to build a website. It's been happening for 20 years or more. Okay, um, So you need to think about what's the market share they've got? Is it GoDaddy? How many, what kind of websites do they host? What's the performance like? There will be feedback online. Let me show you this website. What do you think? Nothing. 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 Certainly not love and passion. I don't think the logo matches with the food. No. no. It was. I think it's okay. So this is one of my clients, uh, DeSantis Skating. They're lovely people. And I think I thought I'd become a bit of a website snob because she said, oh, I, she asked me to give her lots of options. So I gave her a document where I compared all the prices, what she would get, whether it included email, hosting, etc. And she picked the cheapest, which was GoDaddy. Um, and I said, okay, I'll help you put it together. And when we sat down and talked about what she wants to do, she wants to provide catering for events. Uh, she lives near Erskine, and she said, well, we don't really want to travel very much, and we've worked out that if we do three or four events a week, then that would be pretty fantastic. And we really only want to do it, you know, in about a 10, 15 mile radius, and we'll advertise a lot on Facebook and Instagram. And I thought, well, can I really justify pushing out a more expensive website? I think it's fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. I think it, it works for our business plan. So in the end I thought, yeah, it's pretty good. Because people want to be able to come, they want to find out what the services are, they want to look at the photo gallery, they want to look at suggestive menus, and they want to be able to con get contact and they can fill in a form. Am I, am I wrong? Yeah, I think no, it's not that's functional. Right? So, yeah, it's 5 99 a month, first month free. Yeah, that's okay. Search engine optimization is not great, but actually, she said, I don't think that's how I'm going to get found. 
I think I'm going to get found through Facebook, sort of digital word of mouth, if you like, on Facebook, gather reviews on my Facebook page, put out great photography, photography on Instagram. Right? Okay, so um, any questions before we talk a bit about marketing? Does your Facebook page um, influence perceptions and your folk are using it, even if they don't click on your link to your website, just them being on your Facebook page, does that increase? Um, yeah, so so there's another, there's my, on my pie chat, let me bring that. And I don't know what the percentage is, I would be completely making it up, but there will be a slither here that looks at social data. Google needs to know if you're open for business, if you're a current business. So it comes to the web pages and looks at fresh content. You know, have you blogged? Have you changed the prices? Is there a new menu? And it will follow every link. So it will go and follow your social presence and have a look at engagement and reviews, bad or negative reviews. So it does take all of that. Account. And your Facebook page can be listed. It can be shown. If someone does a brand and branded name search for you, then one of the URLs that might be shown might be your Facebook page. You quite often get that if people don't have websites and you uh, look up yeah. their... Mm -hmm. How do you determine whether your website is fit for purpose as far as a return on financials or statistical? Where's the okay. success rates? In <coughs> so you would have a business plan, you'd have a financial goal for the end of the year, which might break in down to, to reach this financial figure, you need that many customers. Then you go back to Google Analytics and it will tell you, so on the last website we were on there it showed us how many customers had come to the website and then how many had turned into paying customers. So that's your, that's it. Yeah. But if you, as the gentleman up here was saying, if I'm doing okay, but um, without having to spend the money on the website, you know, Airbnb and Booking.com and that, mm. would you not be expecting to surpass that? Or is it simply replacing it with potentially more profitable um, I, th I think that you, you could potentially surpass it, but you need to, the, the thing about digital is it's so measurable, you need to try and have a go and then measure it. I don't think that, it's not something that happens overnight when I go in and work with lots of people. So that last client, um, they had gone from being a business to business, to business, to business to consumer, and I felt that their expectations of a return were something like, this is all going to happen in three months. I was like, no, 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 this is maybe going to happen in 12 months. Because just as, as I walk through the door, we're a secret. <laughs> Nobody even knows that we're here. We've not done any search engine optimization. We're not doing anything in social media. We're not doing anything offline. So, you know, it needs to have a, a period of time. So, yeah, you, you, could put it, yeah, you could potentially surpass those goals. I certainly know that even if I go to Airbnb and booking.com, I always like to go and look at the person's own website because I expect to get meatier information there. Anything else? No. Okay, right, so marketing your website. The whole variety of things we can do. So we've talked a bit about search engine optimization and labeling correctly and using the right words and having some functionality in the <coughs> content management system where we input the words and the photography to use the right keywords. The keywords usually match exactly what the product is. You know, self-catering cottages, self-catering cottages, loft Romans. Um, self-catering apartment by the sea. I always think that offline gets overlooked when it comes to digital. That especially if you've got people coming in farm tours who might come back and stay, what could you do offline while you've got a captive audience to tell them about your other products or services? Whether that might be flyers or postcards that you can hand to them or posters. I think that we always overlook offline now. <coughs> um, there's the social media marketing email marketing and paid advertising options. The website has to be marketed, or as I said, it's a secret. Nobody actually knows that it's there. Search engine optimization alone is so competitive. There's a whole load of things that we have to do. This is the tool that Andrew spoke about, Google My Business. So you can see here, if I look up the Hideaway experience, that it comes up here with the dot on the map and the reviews. This is from Google My Business, so I shall now go and look up Google My Business. It's a free tool, Google Analytics is free, Google Search Console is free, Google My Business is free. <coughs> so, then you can, so I, I've got an account, so I, essentially I can sign in 
or you can go and sign up and manage down. And that's where you get your dot on the map. And it will ask you to put in your business name and the address of your business. And you can then move the red dot on the map if it's not exactly in the right place. There's usually some kind of email or text message verification to prove that you are you, that you are claiming your business listing. And that means that your name will appear next to the, the name of the business will appear next to the red dot. But it's become quite sophisticated. <clears throat> so if I go to... So this is where, on Google My Business, you can up, so this is a, a jewellery business in Stirling, where you can upload your own images here. You put in your opening, closing time, telephone number, ask where people can ask questions, you can answer them, it's quite interactive. And then you can upload products and you can upload buy now button, view offer, you can upload special offers and you can also post the way that you post on social media. So I, I think I have no real evidence of this, but obviously Google Plus was closed, it didn't work, so Google had to go to a social media platform. So they've now, in the last couple of years, this tool has become greatly enhanced with all the functionality that you can add here. And I ran an event for someone else a couple of months ago all about voice search engine optimization. So, you know, when you ask Alexa or one of these, uh, is it Echo, the Google Echo, if you ask them questions, they can only give you one answer, you don't get a page of search results. And if you're asking about directions or locations, Google take a lot of their information from Google My Business that's where they get the data to answer questions. Yeah. So if you want any of the voice assistants to answer a question about you, this is one of the first places that you want to be listed. Okay. They don't all go here, so I think it's, um, what's Apple's voice assistant called? Siri. 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 Um, is, that, is that good? Do you have another? Is it not? Can't, 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 anyway, there's another tool. But, 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 Google, but Apple have Apple Maps, right? So that's something coming in the future. How does that information get onto Google? Because I'm pretty sure that I, you know when you get your, your when you Google car sale, it comes up with that information <coughs> down the side, uh -huh. and pictures and reviews and address and everything. We put it on. No, I've not put it on. Did you I have, have a to go on it to know that I've not put it on. Did you have a, a Google um, Google Plus? I've, I've, said, sometimes yeah, people can do it. Yeah, it came exactly how it was, and then I went on and claimed that as my business. I've, yeah. I've claimed, so I've got Google My Business, uh -huh. I've got 